Amy, that, correct Amy, that was a guitar. I'm Lara from Theatre of Science, welcome to another interactive science lesson. Um, last lesson we did sound, today we're going to go a bit more advanced and do music. Sound happens when air vibrates. Hitting a drum, that makes a noise because it vibrates. Um, guitar strings, they vibrate. We'll look at them again in a bit. And if you put your hand on your voice box, uh, even if you speak, actually, you can really clearly hear vibrations. All objects that vibrate produce uh, pressure waves in the air. Objects that vibrate make the air around them vibrate and that creates like a chain reaction that we saw last week, which gets to your ear. Now, I did show you last week, Amy, you're going to get your story time right at the end. You're going to keep you hanging. So we, we looked last week at how a sound wave is what's called a longitudinal wave, which means that it vibrates in the same direction as the energy moves. So can you see a kind of pulse of energy moving along there? So that is the kind of wave that sound is. Light moves like that. So that's light, and that is sound, okay? So now I've told you that, I'm going to massively confuse you by uh, drawing a sound wave like this because it's just much easier to label the bits this way. So when we're talking about sound, this is how we tend to draw the wave, even though that's, that's not right. Okay, but sorry, forget about it. The height of the wave, or the amplitude, if you want to be posh, is uh, the volume. So the higher a sound wave, the louder it is. And something called the wavelength here is just any distance from one bit of a wave to the same bit of a wave, that's the wavelength. Um, that decides how high or low the note is. Kind of decides how much energy the wave has got. So um, waves with a long wavelength like that are low and waves with a very short wavelength like that are very high. Um, and a big word that we use when we talk about sound is frequency. Frequency means how many waves per second. So let's say that there's like a point here. Well, let's say that that is one second, okay? So you can see that in one second, this wave would just travel like one wave's worth in one second. So the, that frequency would be one wave per second. You measure it in hertz. Have you ever seen like a capital H and a little Z? That's how you measure frequency. So the frequency of this sound wave is one wave per second travelling by. And the frequency of this wave is, well, loads in it, like one, two, three, a, a lot. Let's say 20. That wave's travelling at 20 waves per second. That wave's travelling at one wave per second. So the frequency of this wave is one hertz and the frequency of this wave is 20 hertz. Um, and frequency is how we talk about how we can hear sound. So humans can hear between waves that are traveling between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Whereas animals, they often do better than that. Dogs, I learned this revising for this lesson, dogs can hear up to 45,000 hertz, 45,000 waves passing a point per second, dogs can hear that. Cats can hear 64,000. How annoyed are cats getting by dog whistles? I always thought dogs had the best hearing. And bats, obviously, which are crazy and use like echolocation, which we looked at last week, uh, they can hear up to 110,000 hertz. So that's frequency for you if I'm talking about frequency today. That's all I mean. How many waves per second? So everything vibrates. Everything produces these pressure waves. But if the pressure wave is a loud enough volume, like a big enough wave, and if it's a frequency that falls in between 20 times per second and 20,000 times per second, then we can hear it and we call it a sound wave. Now, everything vibrates at its own special frequency, or usually a lot of different frequencies, and we call that an object's natural frequency, which leads me to something very cool. Adults probably know about this. Um, it's not really thought of as a science experiment, is it? It's more a party trick. But um, don't worry if it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work with summer wine wine glasses, but it does work with this one really nicely. We are going to find the natural uh, frequency of this wine glass. And to do that, you do something called the slip stick method. You wet your finger a little bit. You should have a jug of water with you. 
just uh, wet your finger and then have some patience, it might take a while. Move your finger around the outside of the wine glass. Oh, straight away. So this, I chose my best glass. You might not get a result like that straight away. I'll, I brought this one to show you that it's not you. Sometimes they just don't work as well. You can kind of hear that. It's okay, isn't it? This wine glass must be just the right thickness of glass. Isn't that beautiful? So what you're hearing is the wine glass vibrating at its natural frequency. What's actually happening is the same thing that happens when a violin bow gets pulled over a violin string. It's called slip and stick friction. So your finger is sticking to the glass particles and then pulling and coming off and then sticking to another bit and pulling and coming off. And your finger is sort of pulling the glass particles around so that they start vibrating. You could just do that all day. Aww. If you can't get it working, oh, Kevin says soapy water works best. Oh good, Caitlin's yours works. If you can't get it working, sometimes going around the outside works. But something I only found out when I was fiddling for this lesson is that um, some of them it works on the bottom as well. Try that. But because it's a thicker bit of glass, you get a very different note. Dominic Miller. It is fun. Wow, beautiful. Okay, okay, gotta move on, gotta move on. But um, so that's the natural frequency of ah, your wine glass. Um, and guitars work using natural frequencies as well. So get your elastic band. Where's mine? Here it is. Um, oh yeah. Uh, if you've got an adult with you and you think it'll work, then then do this. If you haven't got an adult with you, then don't do it because you, you might just smash your glass. But if you, we did a trick last week where we hung a bit of uh, metal cutlery from a shoelace or piece of string and clanked it against something and the sound travelled up the string to our ears. You can kind of do the same with this. So if you put an elastic band over your glass, if your elastic band is small, Fab noise, Millie, that's good. If your elastic band is small, you could just put it over this bit. You can hear that doesn't make a very good loud noise. That's because the elastic band is dampening the glass. Um, so it's not been allowed to vibrate. And it's also because, yeah, not many uh, air particles are vibrating. If you put it up to your ear like this, and then you do it. Oh, so nice. But basically all the guitar is, is loads of strings, elastic bands like that. But with a massive, massive bit of wood, like the, let's call it the sound box, which the strings force the sound box to vibrate at its uh, natural frequency, or one of its natural frequencies, okay? And then the sound box vibrating makes the air inside vibrate, at that frequency as well. So you've got what we call a whole system vibrating, which makes a really loud sound. Because basically the more particles that are vibrating, the louder the sound is. And that's why you see a guitar has, um, has a bridge like this. So you can see that the guitar strings aren't really, aren't actually touching the sound box, because if they did, it'd be like, what just happened with me with the wine glass and the elastic band, it would dampen it. So the guitar strings are sort of specially organised so that this sound box can vibrate as much as possible. Uh, and that's called resonance, that's where the word resonating comes from. It's when one object, so in this case uh, the strings, forces another object to vibrate at its same frequency. So there you go. But that is obviously not the only way that guitar works, is it? That would be very boring. You'd have to change the strings. So get your elastic band again and Set, I set you your homework, you had to put different size spoons onto a piece of string and stick the string in your ears and whack the teaspoons against things and see what happened. And you should have found that different size spoons had a different pitch, like vibrated a different amount, made a different note. So get your elastic band again and see if you can make a different note by pulling the string, making it tighter or slacker, shorter or longer. Can't you? 
So what you're doing is changing the length of the string changes its natural frequency so it gives you a different note. And shorter strings vibrate faster. And faster vibrations, as we've seen, uh, have a higher pitch, make a higher note. But strings do not only vibrate at one frequency. The same sound, even if it sounds like one note, can have a lot of different frequencies. So see if you can see this. So if I play, say, the, uh, the D string, The main note that you're hearing is a, a D, the fundamental note is a D, but you're hearing loads of other notes as well at loads of different frequencies. And if you play the guitar, you'll know about harmonics. Um, we call these all these different frequencies harmonics. And if you poke the guitar very gently in just the right place, you can dampen down all those other frequencies and you're left with the fundamental note. Let's see if we can do it. So if you want to tune a guitar, quite often you use a harmonic because it's just much easier to hear than that. The clarinet works in a slightly different way. It is a column of vibrating air. And when you change the length of the air, instead of changing the string length, you change the length of the air inside the column and it vibrates at a different frequency, which we can do. So you can imagine that this is a clarinet. But instead of putting air inside it, we're going to put water inside it. So give it a little tap with your spoon. Very nice. You could make a prediction here, couldn't you? What's going to happen when you add water? Is the note going to get higher or lower? Is it going to vibrate with a higher frequency and make a high pitched note? Or is it going to vibrate with a lower frequency? Let's see. Whoa. So you can hear, can't you, that we sort of we've gone past the point where we we're finding any natural frequencies in this class. Sounds a bit dead now. So this is like a clarinet, except we're using water. So on a clarinet, I'm embarrassed now because I know that Ella from Leeds plays the clarinet. I don't really play the clarinet, but if you cover up all the holes, you make a really long column of vibrating air, and it sounds low. <laughs> When we just had the glass empty, um, or just a tiny little bit of water in, so it was a very short column of vibrating water in the glass's case, um, you could just take a few, just put a couple of fingers on so that you're releasing all these holes. You make a short column of air and it sounds higher. Sorry, I love it. Right, do you know what it is? It's story time. Martha from Cornwall plays the violin and Aaron plays the clarinet. In a clarinet, it's this reed at the top. You guys know, Aaron knows, Ella knows. It's the reed that makes the air vibrate inside. And um, this was my reed when I started out with this lesson this afternoon. Can you see that? It's pretty scabby. I blame my children. Story time, let's go. Now, um, we try and look at all kinds of different people, don't we, in story times, like men, women, old, young, whatever. <laughs> um, we haven't looked at anyone who is differently abled. Okay, we would say disabled. I'm saying differently abled because having a disability isn't always a disadvantage all the time, as we will see. Uh, it can lead to some amazing discoveries. So, I was absolutely delighted to find this person. What an incredible character. This is Wanda Diaz Merced. She grew up in Puerto Rico and as a child she was absolutely fascinated by space and probably like a lot of you, uh, she dreamed of flying in a space shuttle and visiting different galaxies that she used to play with her sister at home. As a teenager she, she noticed that she wasn't seeing as well as she used to um, and this got worse and worse and worse very quickly um, by the time she was doing her physics degree at the University of Puerto Rico uh, she found out why it turned out she had damage to her retina 
caused by childhood diabetes and eventually she would lose her sight completely. Um, now she says, I wasn't understanding anything in the classroom, not a thing. I couldn't see what the lecturers were writing on the board and I couldn't see the books. She couldn't access her education. And eventually she had to decide, did she quit or did she keep going? She's the hero of story time, so you know, don't you, that she kept going. Uh, she had a turning point when she bumped into a friend in the corridor and he said, you need to come and hear this. And he played her a really eerie tune and then told her that it was actually the sound of the sun. See, the sun is not silent. The sun vibrates and pulses and scientists had sped up those vibrations so that they could be heard by human ears. Um, and Wanda says, it was so inspiring. I could hear the sun in real time. And when it finished, I could hear the galaxy in the background. So Wanda decided there and then she was going to be an astronomer. And even though she couldn't see, she repeated her classes just again and again and again, as long as it took until she got her degree. It took six years. And after that, to get some experience, she applied for an internship with somebody called Robert Candy at the Goddard Space Flight Center, belonging to NASA, and he took her on. She says this was an absolutely fantastic act of trust on his part. She didn't have any of the grades that she needed. She didn't have the experience. And she says she felt like the other students were just speaking a foreign language. Um, but she grabbed his hand and said, I don't know anything. And he just replied, I'm not worried. And do you know what? Because Robert believed that she could do great things, Wanda's confidence grew uh, and she did do something absolutely amazing. So she started studying a star called EX Hydrae. It's about one trillion kilometres away from Earth. It's about 30 times more massive than our sun. But like all stars do, it had come to the end of its life. So it stopped burning and collapsed under its own weight, releasing a lot of energy. You know what it's called when uh, stars die and release a lot of energy? Supernova! So this supernovaing star was giving off more energy in one second than our sun gives off in 10 days. Now the most energetic activities that astronomers can possibly study are called gamma ray bursts. So EX hydrate was giving off a lot of gamma rays. The thing is, gamma rays are actually invisible to the human eye. Um, actually, most of what stars give off is invisible. They give off X-rays, radio waves. What we call light is just a teeny tiny little portion of the waves that humans can see. So, to study the stars, scientists use graphs to show them what is being given off, like this one, okay? So, showing uh, intensity over time. And you can see here that this is um, the star giving off a gamma ray burst because you've got this sudden burst of intensity of the wave over time. Now Wanda said she wanted to experience the, the excitement and wonder that came with detecting a gamma ray burst. But by this point she had completely lost her sight. And then she realised that a graph is really just a table of numbers that scientists have turned into something that they can see. So with other researchers, she built a computer program that took the same numbers, but turned them into sound. So instead of lines on a graph, you heard like notes. So maybe the highest number would be given like the highest pitch, and then the lowest number would be the very lowest pitch. And then all those values in the middle would be scaled so that each note represented a different number. And we call this um, sonification. If you listen to numbers instead of looking at them, it's called sonification. See, the ear is really, really good at picking up lots of information. You know this, if you watch a film, you can tell that a character is feeling happy, sad, shy, expectant. Your ears are great at working out patterns. So using sonification, Wanda could work at the level of the best astronomer. And not only that, but listening to the gamma ray bursts, she actually spotted something that astronomers looking at the graphs had missed. Uh, she listened to the really low frequency sounds, so basically the baseline, and she noticed gases behaving in a way that is not predicted by computer models. And this led to a discovery about uh, supernovas and star formation. Um, a discovery that was made by hearing the numbers. Wanda says, 
I had my own way to explore the data that really empowered me. It brought me to think that this is something that I can do. Now, people had turned numbers into sounds in the past, but they'd stopped doing it. So Wanda assumed that, well, there must be something wrong with this method then. So for her PhD, she decided to test it out. So what she did was she got groups of people and she gave them some information about black holes and she gave it to them in a way that they could only see it and then that she they could only hear it and then that they could hear and see the information and sure enough as you would expect really it turns out when we combine sound with visuals humans pick up more information so this was a really positive result but actually Wanda felt quite sad after she'd worked that out because she said uh, well, I realised that people like me had been completely left out of astronomy for no reason. And then she says that she decided that no, this is her opportunity to use her results to make astronomy more equal so everyone can participate. So she worked in astronomy for a long time, University of Glasgow, Harvard Smithsonian Centre, um, and she says she doesn't want age, disability, whether you're a boy or a girl, how much money you've got, to control how far you get with science. She wants astronomy to trust that all people can contribute just as they are. Um, she says, I have to study, study, study. I am very determined. If I can do science, anyone can. No excuses. And I thought you would like this. She says, my advice to young people would be to remember that outstanding people do not become great overnight. That is really important. People are not born outstanding. They have to keep focus until they become victors in their mission. Not giving up is really hard, but just keep moving forward find good mentors and be a good mentee. There you go. Wanda Diaz Merced. You can look up her TED talk, it's very good. That's the end of our music lesson. So as usual, I will say a very big uh, thank you so much for joining me. I cannot imagine that anyone who has turned up to my music lesson during the summer holidays has not liked my Facebook page and subscribed to me on YouTube. But if you haven't, sort yourself out please and do that um there's a, a magazine just been uploaded to my patreon page if you're feeling like supporting me monetarily on a monthly basis it's a good idea next week because it's the summer holidays i want to do something different and we'll do the science of jam tarts so we will make some jam tarts you just need flour butter and jam basically and then we'll make jam tarts and i'll talk about the science of the jam tarts anything from the pressure of the biscuit cutter to uh, the definition of berries so yeah, that's next week. So I hope to see you then. Bye!